This cannot be true, as we have seen, so far as natural ability is concerned. Talented people get rich, and blockheads get rich. Intellectually brilliant people get rich, and very stupid people get rich. Physically strong people get rich, and weak and sickly people get rich. Some degree of ability to think and understand is, of course, essential. But insofar natural ability is concerned, any man or woman who has sense enough to read and understand these words can certainly get rich. Also, we have seen that it is not a matter of environment. Location counts for something. One would not go to the heart of the Sahara and expect to do successful business. Getting rich involves the necessity of dealing with men and of being where there are people to deal with. And if these people are inclined to deal in the way that you want to deal, so much the better. But that is about as far as environment goes. If anybody else in your town can get rich, so can you. And if anybody else in your state can get rich, so can you. Again, it is not a matter of choosing some particular business or profession. People get rich in every business and in every profession, while their next door neighbors in the same vocation remain in poverty. It is true that you will do best in a business which you like and which is congenial to you. And if you have certain talents which are well developed, you will do best in a business which calls for the exercise of those talents. Also, you will do best in a business which is suited to your locality. An ice cream parlor would do better in a warm climate than in Greenland, and a salmon fishery will succeed better in the Northwest than in Florida, where there are no salmon. But aside from these general limitations, getting rich is not dependent upon your engaging in some particular business, but upon your learning to do things in a certain way. If you are now in business, and anybody else in your locality is getting rich in the same business, while you are not getting rich, it is because you are not doing things in the same way that the other person is doing them. No one is prevented from getting rich by lack of capital. True, as you get capital, the increase becomes more easy and rapid. But one who has capital is already rich, and does not need to consider how to become so. No matter how poor you may be, if you begin to do things in a certain way, you will begin to get rich, and you will begin to have capital. The getting of capital is a part of the process of getting rich, and it is a part of the result which invariably follows the doing of things in a certain way. You may be the poorest man on the continent and be deeply in debt. You may have neither friends, influence, nor resources. But if you begin to do things in this way, you must infallibly begin to get rich, for the like causes must produce like effects. If you have no capital, you can get capital. If you're in the wrong business, you can get into the right business. If you're in the wrong location, you can go to the right location. And you can do so by beginning in your present business and in your present location to do things in the certain way which causes success. Chapter 3. Is Opportunity Monopolized? No man is kept poor because opportunity has been taken away from him, because other people have monopolized the wealth and have put a fence around it. You may be shut off from engaging in business in certain lines, but there are other channels open to you. Probably it would be hard for you to get control of any of the great railroad systems. That field is pretty well monopolized, but the electric railway business is still in its infancy and offers plenty of scope for enterprise. And it will be but a very few years until traffic and transportation through the air will become a great industry, and in all its branches will give employment to hundreds of thousands and perhaps to millions of people. Why not turn your attention to the development of aerial transportation instead of competing with J.J. Hill and others for a chance in the steam railway world? It is quite true that if you are a working man and the employee of the Steel Trust, you have very little chance of becoming the owner of the plant in which you work. But it is also true that if you will commence to act in a certain way, you can soon leave the employee of the Steel Trust. You can buy a farm from 10 to 40 acres and engage in business as a producer of foodstuffs. There is great opportunity at this time for men who will live upon small tracts of land and cultivate the same intensively. Such men will certainly get rich. You may say that it is impossible for you to get the land, but I'm going to prove to you that it is not impossible, and that you can certainly get a farm if you will go to work in a certain way. Man's right to life means his right to have the free and unrestricted use of all things which may be necessary to his fullest mental, spiritual, and physical unfoldment or, in other words, his right to be rich. I shall not speak of riches in a figurative way. To be really rich does not mean to be satisfied or contented with a little. 
No man ought to be satisfied with little if he is capable of using and enjoying more. The purpose of nature is the advancement and unfoldment of life, and every man should have all that can contribute to the power, elegance, beauty, and richness of life. To be content with less is sinful. The man who owns all he wants for the living of all the life he is capable of living is rich, and no man who has not plenty of money can have all he wants. Life has advanced so far and become so complex that even the most ordinary man or woman requires a great amount of wealth in order to live in a manner that even approaches completeness. Every person naturally wants to become all that they are capable of becoming. This desire to realize innate possibilities is inherent in human nature. We cannot help wanting to be all that we can be. Success in life is becoming what you want to be. You can become what you want to be only by making use of things, and you can have the free use of things only as you become rich enough to buy them. To understand the science of getting rich is therefore the most essential of all knowledge. There is nothing wrong in wanting to get rich. The desire for riches is really the desire for a richer, fuller, and more abundant life, and that desire is praiseworthy. The man who does not desire to live more abundantly is abnormal. And so the man who does not desire to have money enough to buy all he wants is abnormal. There are three motives for which we live. We live for the body, we live for the mind, we live for the soul. No one of these is better or holier than the other. All are alike desirable, and no one of the three, body, mind, or soul, can live fully if either of the others is cut short of full life and expression. It is not right or noble to live only for the soul and deny mind or body, and it is wrong to live for the intellect and deny body or soul. We are all acquainted with the loathsome consequences of living for the body and denying both mind and soul, and we see that real life means the complete expression of all that man can give forth through body, mind, and soul. Whatever he can say, no man can be really happy or satisfied unless his body is living fully in every function and unless the same is true of his mind and his soul. Wherever there is unexpressed possibility or function not performed, there is unsatisfied desire. Desire is possibility seeking expression or function seeking performance. Man cannot live fully in body without good food, comfortable clothing, and warm shelter, and without freedom from excessive toil. Rest and recreation are also necessary to his physical life. He cannot live fully in mind without books and time to study them, without opportunity for travel and observation, or without intellectual companionship. To live fully in mind, he must have intellectual recreations and must surround himself with all the objects of art and beauty he is capable of using and appreciating. To live fully in soul, man must have love, and love is denied expression by poverty. A man's highest happiness is found in the bestowal of benefits on those he loves, Love finds its most natural and spontaneous expression in giving. The man who has nothing to give cannot fill his place as a husband or father, as a citizen or as a man. It is in the use of material things that a man finds full life for his body, develops his mind, and unfolds his soul. It is therefore of supreme importance to him that he should be rich. It is perfectly right that you should desire to be rich. If you are a normal man or woman, you cannot help doing so. It is perfectly right that you should give your best attention to the science of getting rich, for it is the noblest and most necessary of all studies. If you neglect this study, you are derelict in your duty to yourself, to God, and humanity, for you can render to God and humanity no greater service than to make the most of yourself. Chapter 2 There is a science of getting rich. There is a science of getting rich, and it is an exact science, like algebra or arithmetic. There are certain laws which govern the process of acquiring riches. Once these laws are learned and obeyed by any man, he will get rich with mathematical certainty. The ownership of money and property comes as a result of doing things in a certain way. Those who do things in this certain way, whether on purpose or accidentally, get rich. While those who do not do things in this certain way, no matter how hard they work or how able they are, remain poor. It is a natural law that like causes always produce like effects, and therefore any man or woman who learns to do things in this certain way will infallibly get rich. That the above statement is true is shown by the following facts. Getting rich is not a matter of environment, 
poor. If it were, all the people in certain neighborhoods would become wealthy. The people of one city would all be rich, while those of other towns would all be poor. Or the inhabitants of one state would roll in wealth, and those of an adjoining state would be in poverty. But everywhere we see rich and poor living side by side, in the same environment, and often engaged in the same vocations. When two men are in the same locality, and in the same business, and one gets rich while the other remains poor, it shows that getting rich is not primarily a matter of environment. Some environments may be more favorable than others, but when two men in the same business are in the same neighborhood, and one gets rich while the other fails, it indicates that getting rich is the result of doing things in a certain way. And further, the ability to do things in this certain way is not due solely to the possession of talent. For many people who have great talent remain poor, while others who have very little talent get rich. Studying the people who have gotten rich, we find that they are an average lot in all respects, having no greater talents and abilities than other men. It is evident that they do not get rich because they possess talents and abilities that other men have not, but because they happen to do things in a certain way. Getting rich is not the result of saving or thrift. Many very penurious people are poor, while free spenders often get rich. Nor is getting rich due to doing things which others fail to do. For two men in the same business often do almost exactly the same things, and one gets rich while the other remains poor or becomes bankrupt. From all these things, we must come to the conclusion that getting rich is the result of doing things in a certain way. If getting rich is the result of doing things in a certain way, then any man or woman who can do things in that way can become rich, and the whole matter is brought within the domain of exact science. The question arises here whether this certain way may not be so difficult that only a few may follow it. This obituary can become your vision of the kind of person you wish to be and the kind of values that you wish to live by. No one is perfect, and we all have a long way to go in living our lives consistent with our highest values. But the very exercise of writing out your obituary will exert a powerful influence on everything that you do thereafter. Both consciously and unconsciously, you will be drawn toward living and acting more and more like the person you described in that final testament. Organize your values. Once you've decided upon your values, your work is not over. Now you have to organize your values by priority. You have to decide which value is more important and which value is less important. If you wrote out each of your values on small squares of paper, and then you had to throw away all the squares but one, which one would you keep? This then becomes your foremost value, the one that takes precedence over all the others. Which would be your second most important value? Your third, your fourth, and so on. Your order of priority is extremely important in determining the kind of person you are and the kind of life you live. Many people organize their values with number one being God, number two being their family, number three being their health, number four being their career, and perhaps number five being success. A person with this order of values is saying that when push comes to shove, I will always favor the higher order value over the lower order value. Values order forces you to choose. If your family comes before your health or your work, you would always sacrifice your health or your work for the well-being of your family. If your order of values was changed, and your work or financial success came before your health, you would be saying that you would sacrifice your health if that was necessary to get ahead in your career. I have known businessmen who put career success ahead of their families in their order of priority. This is a good choice, but in reality, integrity is more than a value. It is the one value of mind that assures or guarantees all the other values that you select. The economic and personal results of individuals and corporations with clear values always tend to be far superior to those of companies and individuals whose values are vague or unclear. Clarify your personal values. Your starting point toward higher self-confidence and personal greatness is to first of all clarify your values for yourself. It is for you to decide for yourself the values that you believe in. What do you stand for? And even more, 
What will you not stand for? What values do you espouse that you are willing to sacrifice for? What values would you pay for or sweat for or maybe even die for? Do you value your family, your God, your health, your work or career? Do you value principles such as freedom, liberty, compassion for the less fortunate or reverence for life? Do you believe in honesty and truth and sincerity and hard work and success? Whatever your values are, think them through and write them down. Who do you most admire? A useful exercise is for you to think of the men and women living and dead whom you most admire. What qualities or attributes of these people do you consider the most important? If you could be like any one of these people, which of their qualities would you most want to emulate? When you look around you at the people you admire, what qualities of these people do you consider to be the most important? What qualities do you look for in your friends and associates when you're trying to decide whether or not to become deeply involved with them? What do you think are the fundamental qualities or values that underlie business and personal relationships? What are your values? Now, values are non-negotiable. When you select a value, if it's to be one of your values at all, it becomes inviolable. Either it is a fixed value and you live every part of your life consistent with it, or it is not one of your values. The foundation of self-confidence is for you to live your life consistent with your innermost values and principles while thinking and acting in harmony with your highest aspirations. Men and women with the most rock-solid self-confidence are those who are absolutely clear about what it is they believe to be right and good and worthwhile and who live their lives consistent with these values. Everything they do or say is an expression of their innermost convictions. Your whole world can fall down around you, but as long as you know that you are doing the right thing, you will have a deep inner sense of calm that will manifest itself in an attitude of confidence and self-assurance in any situation. You'll have many ups and downs in life, but what is most important is that you remain true to yourself. And then, as Shakespeare said, thou canst not then be false to any man. Determine your values. The starting point of developing high levels of self-confidence and becoming a superior human being is for you to think through and decide upon your values. Superior men and women are those who have taken the time to decide clearly what it is they believe in and in what order, and they have then organized their lives so that everything that they do reflects those values. Recently I addressed about 150 members of the national sales force of a very successful company. This company had started from an idea and had grown very rapidly in an extremely competitive market and the company was very profitable. All the people at the meeting were remarkably positive and upbeat and had a special quality of goodness about them. When I commented on this, the president of the company showed me the value statement that the executives of the company had worked out before they had begun operations. There were two pages of values and principles which were given to everyone in the company when they began. These two pages had been subsequently reduced onto plasticized cards that each person could carry in their wallet or purse. The president told me an interesting story. He said that whenever two or more people in the company were wrestling with a decision of any kind, even over the telephone, they would pull out their plasticized cards describing the corporate values. They would then review the values together one by one and compare the various options available to them with each value. Whatever decision they finally made would always stand the values test without question. Values in business. In a recent study covering 25 years of business history, the researchers found that the companies that had very clear written values to which everyone in the company ascribed had earned an average of 700% greater profit over the 25 years than other companies in the same industries that did not have written codes of values. As within, so without. Whenever I conduct a strategic planning exercise for a corporation, 
the executives of the corporation always select integrity as their highest value and most important organizing principle for the entire corporation. In my experience, almost every corporation will select the value of integrity as one of their foremost organizing principles. Now the word integrity, according to the dictionary, means perfect, undivided, complete, unified, a single whole, without blemish or fault. It's a fine value to choose. You cannot have a value when it is convenient and put it aside when it is not convenient. You cannot have a little bit of integrity. It must be all or nothing. The act of selecting your values is also the act of clearly stating to yourself and sometimes to others exactly how you will live your life from this moment forward. Once you have selected a value and you have declared it to be one of your unifying principles, you are in effect saying that this is something upon which you will never compromise. And your level of adherence to the values that you have personally selected is the real measure of your character, your true quality as a human being. Unshakable self-confidence comes from unshakable commitment to your values. When, deep down inside yourself, you know that you will never violate your highest principles, you experience a deep sense of personal power that enables you to deal openly and honestly and with complete self-confidence in almost every human situation. Values Clarification If you're having any difficulty in clarifying your values, a very helpful exercise is to take some time to write out your own obituary or eulogy. Imagine that everyone you know and care about is gathered at your funeral to pay their last respects. The minister reads your eulogy to this assembly of people, and in it he describes the person you became over the course of your lifetime. He describes not only what you accomplished and what you contributed to the lives of others, but he reads out the virtues, values, and qualities that you were known for by the people around you. When they had to choose one or the other, they regularly chose their work over spending time with their spouse and children. And as a result, both the marriages and the careers have run into serious trouble. Selecting your values and then putting them in order of importance actually creates a mental and emotional structure that enables you to make better decisions and choices in every area of your life. Integrity Revisited The principle of integrity or adherence to your values seems to be a law of the universe. Whenever you violate or compromise your integrity for anything, there seems to be a great power or force of retribution that will not allow you to get away with it. Integrity seems to be an absolute requirement for successful human living. A failing in integrity or compromising your values not only seems to bring about a punishment that fits the crime, whether it's in business and politics or personal life, but it seems to create a high level of stress, unhappiness and inner turmoil in the life of the individual. This need for absolute integrity seems to require that you live in truth with all people and under all circumstances. Living in truth means that you never live a lie. It means that you never compromise your integrity for the sake of a job or money or a relationship. It means that you always do and say what you know to be right and true, no matter what the short-term cost or benefit. Living in truth means that you do not pretend or practice self-delusion. You face life your relationships and your circumstances exactly as they are, not as you wish they would be. Living in truth means that you never stay in a situation that makes you unhappy or which you feel for any reason is wrong for you. A practical manual, not a treatise upon theories. It is intended for the men and women whose most pressing need is for money, who wish to get rich first and philosophize afterward. It is for those who have, so far, found neither the time, the means, nor the opportunity to go deeply into the study of metaphysics, but who want results and who are willing to take the conclusions of science as a basis for action, without going into all the processes by which those conclusions were reached. It is expected that the reader will take the fundamental statements upon faith, 
just as he would take statements concerning a law of electrical action if they were promulgated by a Marconi or an Edison, and taking the statements upon faith that he will prove their truth by acting upon them without fear or hesitation. Every man or woman who does this will certainly get rich, for the science herein applied is an exact science, and failure is impossible. For the benefit, however, of those who wish to investigate philosophical theories and so secure a logical basis for faith, I will here cite certain authorities. The monistic theory of the universe, the theory that one is all and that all is one, that one substance manifests itself as the seeming many elements of the material world, is of Hindu origin and has been gradually winning its way into the thought of the Western world for 200 years. It is the foundation of all the Oriental philosophies and of those of Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Schopenhauer, Hegel, and Emerson. The reader who would dig to the philosophical foundations of this is advised to read Hegel and Emerson for himself. In writing this book, I have sacrificed all other considerations to plainness and simplicity of style so that all might understand. The plan of action laid down herein was deduced from the conclusions of philosophy. It has been thoroughly tested and bears the supreme test of practical experiment. It works. If you wish to know how the conclusions were arrived at, read the writings of the authors mentioned above. And if you wish to reap the fruits of their philosophies in actual practice, read this book and do exactly as it tells you to do. The Author Chapter 1. The Right to be Rich Whatever may be said in praise of poverty, the fact remains that it is not possible to live a really complete or successful life unless one is rich. No man can rise to his greatest possible height in talent or soul development unless he has plenty of money. For to unfold the soul and to develop talent he must have many things to use, and he cannot have these things unless he has money to buy them with. A man develops in mind, soul, and body by making use of these things, and society is so organized that man must have money in order to become the possessor of things. Therefore, the basis of all advancement for man must be the science of getting rich. The object of all life is development, and everything that lives has an inalienable right to all the development it is capable of attaining. At different periods, the tide of opportunity sets in different directions, according to the needs of the whole, and the particular stage of social evolution which has been reached. At present, in America, it is setting towards agricultural and the allied industries and professions. Today, opportunity is open before the factory worker in his line. It is open before the businessman who supplies the farmer more than before the one who supplies the factory worker and before the professional man who waits upon the farmer more than before the one who serves the working class. There is an abundance of opportunity for the man who will go with the tide instead of trying to swim against it. So the factory workers, either as individuals or as a class, are not deprived of opportunity. The workers are not being kept down by their masters. They are not being ground by the trusts and combinations of capital. As a class, they are where they are because they do not do things in a certain way. If the workers of America chose to do so, they could follow the example of their brothers in Belgium and other countries and establish great department stores and cooperative industries. They could elect men of their own class to office and pass laws favoring the development of such cooperative industries. And in a few years, they could take peaceable possession of the industrial field. The working class may become the master class whenever they will begin to do things in a certain way. The law of wealth is the same for them as it is for all others. This they must learn, and they will remain where they are as long as they continue to do as they do. The individual worker, however, is not held down by the ignorance or the mental slothfulness of his class. He can follow the tide of opportunity to riches, and this book will tell him how. No one is kept in poverty by a shortness in the supply of riches. There is more than enough for all. A palace as large as the Capitol in Washington might be built for every family on earth from the building material in the United States alone. And under intensive cultivation, this country would produce wool, cotton, linen, and silk enough to clothe each person in the world finer than Solomon was arrayed in all his glory, together with food enough to feed them all luxuriously. The visible supply is practically inexhaustible, and the invisible supply really is inexhaustible. 
Everything you see on earth is made from one original substance out of which all things proceed. New forms are constantly being made and older ones are dissolving, but all are shapes assumed by one thing. There is no limit to the supply of formless stuff or original substance. The universe is made out of it, but it was not all used in making the universe. The spaces in, through, and between the forms of the visible universe are permeated and filled with the original substance, with the formless stuff, with the raw material of all things. Ten thousand times as much has been made might still be made, and even then we should not have exhausted the supply of universal raw material. No man, therefore, is poor because nature is poor, or because there is not enough to go around. Nature is an inexhaustible storehouse of riches. The supply will never run short. Original substance is alive with creative energy and is constantly producing more forms. When the supply of building material is exhausted, more will be produced. When the soil is exhausted so that foodstuffs and materials for clothing will no longer grow upon it, it will be renewed or more soil will be made. When all the gold and silver has been dug from the earth, if man is still in such a stage of social development that he needs gold and silver, more will be produced from the formless. The formless stuff responds to the needs of man. It will not let him be without any good thing. This is true of man collectively. The race as a whole is always abundantly rich, and if individuals are poor, it is because they do not follow the certain way of doing things which makes the individual man rich. The formless stuff is intelligent. It is stuff which thinks. It is alive and is always impelled towards more life. It is the natural and inherent impulse of life to seek to live more. It is the nature of intelligence to enlarge itself and of consciousness to seek to extend its boundaries and find fuller expression. The universe of forms has been made by formless living substance, throwing itself into form in order to express itself more fully. The universe is a great living presence, always moving inherently towards more life and fuller functioning. Nature is formed for the advancement of life. Its impelling motive is the increase of life. For this cause, everything which can possibly minister to life is bountifully provided.